Ah, all right. Ethan Waldman, Joel Zaslowski. Hello, everybody. Ethan's giving a good all wave as well. We are stoked, grateful that you're joining us here for a lovely chat about all things tiny houses. Wow, we'll get into who we are a little bit uh, in a moment, but since this is about you, our participants, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the comments already, and Carrie certainly has a lot of questions stockpiled for us. She wants to talk about framing your tiny house in colder climates, how life becomes more complicated by living in a tiny house. Oh, how to talk about to a local zoning authority who is unhappy about the placement or development of your tiny house and some more stuff. Wow. Um, yes, we will probably get to all those things and a whole lot more. I'm noticing some other familiar faces on the Google event page, Darcy and Michelle and Scott and welcome Debbie, Debbie Schnur here. Wow. I'm, uh, I'm really excited. I'm really grateful for everybody to be here. By the way, just so Ethan and I know that you're with us, that you can hear us, that you can see us just fine, I'd like to do this little thing. Real quick, if you're in North America, type one. If you're in Europe, you can type two. Australia, three. If you're in Asia, type four. This is all on the Google event page itself. You can do it in the questions and answer app as well, which we'll talk to you about in a moment. If you're in South America, type five. If you're in Africa, type six. And if you're in Antarctica, type holy smokes, I'm in Antarctica. All right, I will introduce you to Ethan in just a moment. If you're watching this through the Google event page, please, uh, you can use the Q&A app. It's at the bottom of the video window. Or you can even use, there's a comment section, a threaded comment section on the Google event page as well. And if you want, you can just type, hey, I can hear you. Or yes, things are going just fine just to make sure that you're with us from a technology perspective. Seems like everyone's good. Ethan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I mean, I could certainly do an introduction, but I'm already talking like you're not here for a moment and that's getting kind of awkward for me. So for those of you who are not already familiar, introduce yourself, will ya? All right, uh, thanks Joel, it's great to be here. Um, so my name is Ethan Waldman and uh, I live in a tiny house in northern Vermont uh, that I finished building in 2013. And I live there with my fiance. Her name is Anne. And we did a lot of the building work ourselves. Vermont is a very cold place, so we definitely had to do some things to make the house uh, better in cold climates. And since building the house, I've actually gone on to keep up a weekly blog about tiny houses as well as publish a couple of books about tiny houses. So um, I love interacting with people who are thinking about doing a tiny house, who are already building a tiny house. I love connecting with the energy that you've got around the tiny house movement. So I'm psyched to be here and uh, we already have some great questions. So definitely yeah, psyched to answer them and talk more. Yeah. Well, when Ethan's not talking, I will probably be doing that. I'm your host if you will, uh, my name is Joel Zislowski. And since this is a Simple Rev hosted conversation, people might be wondering, Simple Rev, what's, what's the deal? Well, back in 2013, uh, I started this thing called Simple Rev, which is really at the intersection of community building and simple living. So we like to talk about ourselves as simplicity, your way, at your speed, with your people. Whether it's mindfulness or meditation, tiny houses, permaculture, yoga, homesteading, I mean, all these things that fall under the simple living sun, we're really stoked to be able to bring people together, bring a whole bunch of amazing tiny housers and minimalists together with a whole bunch of other folks who are into sustainability or green living or zero waste or all these other things that float around here. So my role in life these days is just to simply bring people together. And a lot of that is around simple living, the spirit and the principles of it. So we're gonna be hitting that stuff mostly around tiny houses, but our conversation may expand into a little bit more holistic way. But really just to start again, thank you for being with us. You know, our goal for this conversation, and it is a conversation. This isn't just me and Ethan riffing back. We can't have a meaningful conversation without you and your questions and your engagement. So what we want is, well, one, Ethan is a good friend of mine and amazing. I mean, you'll hear his story in just a moment, but I wanna give Ethan a way to share his vast tiny house knowledge and experiences and give you a way to connect with each other 
which you can do on Twitter, you can do on the Google event page. It's not just us. We would love it if everybody participating in this live gets an opportunity to connect with each other. Uh, but really, we're gonna explore what you, you want to explore. So your questions, your participation, your engagement with everyone else is crucial. Ethan, with that in mind, I think we've done a little bit of housekeeping. We've set the stage pretty well. You have a fascinating story about how you got into where you are with building, owning, and living in a tiny house and have been doing it for years. Take us back in time a little bit here and give us some context about how you got to be where sure, you are. Sure, sure. And I've got, I've got some, some slides, some, some things to show, so I can share those. Um, so I figured actually... I would start in the present and then jump back um, just because I know that, you know, some people on this webinar have come from kind of from my world and probably are already familiar with, with the house and then other people have probably come through Simple Rev and maybe have no idea who I am or have never seen my tiny house. So um, we'll start with the, the pretty end picture. Um, so this is my tiny house that I built. Um, it sits on a 22 foot flatbed trailer. Uh, and then the house extends about another two feet off of the trailer. So all, all said, it's 24 feet. The footprint is about 150 square feet. And um, the design that I went for is that I wanted it to fit well kind of in the woods of Vermont. So I, I tried to go with that rough pine, rough cedar. Um, I think I called um, And then on the inside, uh, again, mixing... Um, local woods like pine and cedar um, and then we've got some cherry on the floor and some more industrial metal fixtures and things um, so this is the the end goal but the question is you know how did I get here and so I can skip to what I call initial contact um, which happened in the fall of 2011, um, I was not feeling super enthused about my, my cubicle-based, uh, you know, full-time corporate career job, and I was able to take a sabbatical from work and fulfill uh, a long-term goal of mine, which was to do a bicycle tour. Um, so my first cousin, Dan, and myself embarked on a month-long 1,500-mile bicycle tour on the West Coast. Um, of the US and you know our bikes were essentially our tiny houses we carried everything that we needed in the panniers the small bags that attached to the bikes we slept in tents and we also did a lot of couch surfing um, and it was through couch surfing that we actually ended up staying in three different tiny houses along the way I don't know what it was we were just attracting tiny houses um, huh. so this this was a tiny house that we stayed in. It was completely off grid. It actually was a tool shed that was converted into a tiny house with a small addition. And it was just so cool to me. And I just, I was completely like in love with the idea. Um, but I never really thought of doing a tiny house for myself because I didn't own land and I didn't want to own land. And it wasn't until I found tiny houses on wheels um, that. I realized that I could do a tiny house and I wouldn't need to own land because I'd be able to move the house to the land that I was able to rent or squat or buy or find or, or you know, kind of whatever along the way. And um, so that's kind of my backstory about how I came to the tiny house movement. Um, you know, I returned from the bicycle tour and I started saving money, really. Um, I, I moved out of my, I went into hobo mode is what, what I call it. So I moved hobo out, mode. <laughs> yeah, I moved out of the, of the house I was renting and I moved, I moved in with my parents for a while, um, just trying to save as much money as possible, you know, stopped eating out, stopped buying things, started getting rid of things really, um, and just saving as much money as I could before I ultimately started the house. Okay, but how did you get to the point where you made the decision that you were going to make this huge time commitment? You you built most of the house yourself. You yeah. put in tens of thousands of dollars of your own money into this as a long-term commitment. Where did you go? I was naive. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, I had always wanted to learn how to build, you know, and learn those skills. And 
everything that I read about tiny houses, you know, the only examples that were online at that point were other people who were DIYing tiny houses. And so I was seeing examples of other people who had never built anything before embarking on this project. And I just, I was like, oh, I want to do that. That's what I'm doing. It wasn't really, I mean, it, looking back, it's a huge decision. But at the time, I was just like, just certain that that's what I was going to do. Um, so it didn't feel like a big decision. It just felt like the obvious thing that I had to do, um, which I think is good. If, if you feel that strongly about it, then then it's meant to be. I suppose so. You're right. Even if you don't think about it as a leap of faith, it kind of seems like at least a lot of the people that I talk to who are thinking about getting involved in either going to stay in a tiny house for a month through Airbnb, through some place that they're going to visit or maybe yeah. building their own or having it yeah. contracted out. Um, it's, it's a huge lifestyle change too. Yeah. Except, which I know we're going to get into. We've already got some good questions about that. I well, really looked at it. I, I was really looking at it financially because I think I'm, you know, very logical and I wanted to like make sure it was a financially like a good decision. And so at the time I think I was like, estimating that it would take about $25,000 to build. And so my my rent plus utilities at the time was about $1,200 a month. So basically I said, if I can build this and finish it and live in it for two years, then I'll probably have recouped the costs in terms of what I would have been paying for my house that I was renting. Yeah. Financially, it sounds like a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, it ended up costing more than I thought it would, um, but it still, I would say, has has paid off. And you know, treating it just as a financial decision is foolish because it is a big lifestyle change, and I think a, a very positive lifestyle change. So to to ignore the lifestyle piece and just say it's a financial decision is fine, but it you know you're also reaping amazing lifestyle benefits from the tiny house that are to me priceless and worth, you know, not worth any amount of money Yeah, because they're just great. Well, let's try to get a sense of, from folks who are participating with us right now in terms of where they are on their journey. So here's, here's something, everyone who's watching us live right now in the comments on the Google event page, or if you're better with that Q and a app that Google has, you can even, if you want, you can send a tweet. We are at simple underscore REV. Ethan's at, at Ethan Waldman. Uh, I'm curious, where, where are you on the spectrum? Are you just really fascinated by this tiny house thing and you're casually interested in maybe getting involved or are you actively planning to build one? Maybe even, I know Darcy, Darcy here, who's with us live, he's built two tiny houses in, New Zealand and Australia. Are you like Darcy? Have you built them? Have you been living in one for the past year, two years, three years? Are you one of the savvy veterans who have been doing this for five plus years? These are some of the questions that we have for you and we would like to know your experience, your enthusiasm for it. And obviously we're here because you have questions for us and you want to engage each other. Ethan, what do you say? Should we let's should we open turn it, it up? To, yeah, let's do it. Okay. I've got Green Yonder says he or she is in mid build of the tiny house. So that'd be kind of cool to get the snapshot in time from uh, what what is going on, some of the struggles, maybe some of the things that are surprising. And Glenn and Sandy are also piping in on the Q and A. Well, yeah, being uh, mid build is a is a tough time to be. I thought because I felt that I had basically an expensive pile of lumber on an expensive trailer, but nothing <laughs> that I could live in yet. And so the value only really comes once you're done building it. Yeah. Yeah, there's no squatting in a tiny house mid-build. It's either yeah. done or not done. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's start. Uh, this is just for me and my curiosity, and I know a lot of other people. You already talked about the financial costs, how it it cost a little bit more than you anticipated. Mm -hmm. And just to give people a sense for those who they're not mid build, they haven't built one, they haven't lived in one. They've never even necessarily been in a tiny house before. Yeah. They just see them on Pinterest or your awesome Facebook page. They see videos and pictures. What's the range of financial costs? At least let's, 
we'll just keep it to the United States at first, you know? So sure. within our area, I, there's variables like, are you going to contract out the labor? Are you going to source secondhand materials? What kind of right. insulation are you going to use? So just to kind of set the table, what kind of range of costs may there be for someone who's really looking to get into it? Um, I would say, I mean, of course there are always outliers to what I'm going to say. Um, so these are just averages. I would say on one end, on the low end for a tiny house on wheels, um, the maybe $12,000 range would be a low. And that is you're doing a hundred percent of the labor yourself and you're using not a hundred percent reclaimed materials, but a lot of reclaimed materials. Um, all the way up to, I mean, a tiny house built by a professional tiny house company delivered to you completely finished could be from 50 to $80,000 hmm. depending on what's in it and how big it is. Um, but I would say that the average tiny house is coming in. If it's owner built, it's coming in between, you know, that 15 to 25,000 range and the, you know, pre-built, you know, purchased tiny house is going to be in that 45 to 60 range. Okay. Yeah. That's good base knowledge here. Yeah. I mean, it's a, that's a big range. That's a big, you know, you don't, you don't look at, at traditional homes and see a range that on one end is one number and then on the other end is is like six or seven times that number. I mean, you do, but not within the scope of houses that you'd be looking at personally. Right. You know, right. Tiny houses definitely have a big range. Well, it's kind of cool to see the range of prices and the range of experience too. I'm looking, so Chris says that uh, he or she, Chris, I don't know if you're he or she, so I'll just say Chris just ordered the trailer and awesome. Sandy is saving up and we have green yonder who's mid build. We have other people who are just starting to research whether it's right for them. Got a pretty good range of folks. So Ethan, let's actually get into, we had a number of really good questions already before sure. we even got started with our chat. Some of them are from Carrie mm -hmm. and you are extremely experienced in this first one. I uh, hear I'm just outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it gets pretty cold here for a number of months during the year. So Carrie's asking us for colder climates. Mm -hmm. This is, this is pretty specific here. She's saying two by six framing is suggested, but mm -hmm. is it possible to frame your floor and ceiling with two by sixes and the walls with two by fours? What did you use for your cold weather climate plans? Um, well, to answer the first question, yes, it is possible to frame the walls two by four and then the floor and ceiling two by six. Um, for my house, I did two by four all around. Um, with a tiny house on wheels, you are always trying to, you've got some serious limits. Um, you're limited in how tall your house can be off the ground, and you're also limited by how wide it can be if you want to be able to legally tow the house without having to get any special permits. And so those numbers in most states are 13 feet, six inches from the ground to the top of your house and eight foot, six inches from the very edge to the very edge. And so whenever you increase the size of materials, so for instance, if you make your floor out of two by sixes instead of two by fours, that's two extra inches that you lose inside the house. And then the same thing happens up top. Um, so it's a trade-off because two by six is going to be better insulation. It's going to allow, well, it's not necessarily going to be better insulation. It's going to allow you to put more insulation in that space. And so the compromise that I went for in my house is though I did two by four all around, um, I used what is considered to be the best insulation. And when I say best, I mean, it has the most, R value. And so R value is a measure of how much insulation something gives. Um, so basically I use what's called closed cell spray foam, which is um, an insulation that gets sprayed into the walls in between the studs and then it expands. It's almost like styrofoam. Hmm. And that gives you about R7 per inch. So my walls are about R21 because they put three inches of spray foam. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of science and a There's lot of a lot. behind uh, yes. tiny houses, aren't there? I mean, we yeah, can talk I mean, about the lifestyle and holistically and the big reasons why, but man, you can get really deep into the numbers and the absolutely, science. Absolutely. And so um, just some things to talk about, and sorry if we're going real deep real quick here. What I've been seeing in the last year or so a lot is tiny house specific trailers, which I'm a big fan of because they really cost about the same as a comparable flatbed trailer. But what they do is they give, they, they come designed so that you can actually set your floor into the trailer rather than build your floor on top of the trailer. Mm. So what that does is that it, it either enables you to use two by sixes and get that extra space without losing your head height or you could do two by four inside the trailer and then the tiny house will feel a lot taller, which isn't a problem for me. I'm about five, six, but for you, Joel, I would imagine that you would, you would want to maximize your headroom <laughs> in any, in any tiny house. Yes. Yes. I'm a tall gentleman, but I've been inside of D Williams tiny house before her 55 foot retirement home. 55 we square foot, 55 square foot. Yeah. Retirement home. And, yeah, I wouldn't personally want to be there every single day of my life, but I get how it's right for some people. And I guess that's probably one of the common misconceptions is you have people like me who just due to my physical stature, I think, well, I'm six foot six, like my, my wingspan is seven feet long and my tiny house is going to be double anyone else's tiny house. So why even bother? It's not for me. I'm sure Ethan, you've seen people who weigh a ton, who are tall, who have families kids, dogs, all kinds of things, not just people. It's not like people can just simply fit physically in the house, but they can coexist and be really happy together Absolutely. in small quarters. Why is that still such a big misconception? Well, I think that culturally we've gotten used to bigger houses. And so we look at a smaller space and we, we kind of turn our noses up at it or, or, or look at it and say, I could never do that. When, if you really look back, the, you know, the American home size has grown exponentially just in the last 50 years. So the, the houses that my parents, that our parents grew up in, um, you know, my parents grew up in the 50s and 60s, they shared bedrooms with their siblings. They, they were 800 to 1,000 square foot houses. And now, you know, a 2,000 square foot house is the norm and each kid has their own bedroom. Yeah. And it's, it's certainly nice to have that space. But the thing that, that I object to is suggesting that it's not possible to, to raise kids if they have to share a bedroom or to be in a smaller space with a family. Hmm. Well, this is kind of relevant. I'm looking at a comment from Tina. She says, I'm wondering if you have had conversations with these smaller communities that are starting to host tiny houses. So Ethan, I know recently you were in Asheville, North Carolina for a tiny house event. And she says she saw one in North Carolina and Florida. I, apparently there are not just individuals, but groups, communities that are starting to realize we can do this together and we can set up tiny house, small tiny house communities together. Yep. Ooh. And that's a great, that's a really great model that I think is going to catch on and should catch on, um, which is the idea of having several tiny houses, sharing some land, and then sharing certain resources that maybe aren't practical to have inside of your tiny house. So things that I don't have in my tiny house are include laundry, um, include just, you know, extended storage for for sports that I like to do, such as skiing or bicycling. And so what we're seeing are these tiny house communities where you've got several tiny houses organized around some kind of larger home that can host communal dinners, can give each person some additional storage space, can give each person laundry space, um, and kind of do whatever, whatever the community wants. And, um, I've not had occasion to visit any of these communities yet. I, I do know a few people who are um, exploring creating such communities. Um, but a good website um, is tinyhousecommunity.com. 
creatively. Uh, and that website has done a good job of kind of tracking tiny house communities as they spring up. And so it's a good place to go to look and find tiny house communities and find out if anything's happening near you. So I don't, you know, I don't know the specific ones that, that the, that we're referring to in North Carolina and Florida, because, you know, it's a good thing that I don't know because they're, they're hap they're springing up. They're, they're really starting to, to catch fire, which yeah. I think is, is a great thing. I've noticed that a lot of tiny house people are very literal. Like your website is the tiny house.net tiny house yeah. communities. It's always like, it's always those two words together, tiny house. Yeah. And it's a good thing we don't play drinking games with those words because, oh my goodness, a lot of the conversations I have with people would just be <clears throat> nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. Here's something that's related though. So Scott has a question. Scott's in uh, outside of Cleveland and he's interested about cold weather too. Huh? He says, is it like living in a slab home? Do you know what he means? Is that a, uh, a synonym for or something well, roughly equivalent to a tiny house? What I'm guessing, because I... And, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm guessing is, you know, a house that's built over a basement versus a house that's built just on a slab. And, a and I actually grew up on a house that had no basement, so it was built right on a slab. Mm. And generally, those houses are colder because the basement gives you that airspace of insulation. And it, you know, once you dig down under the earth, depending on where you live, you get about 52 to 55 degrees everywhere all year round. So by having that basement, you're getting that 50 degree air under your house versus in the tiny house, the air under your, under your floor is whatever temperature the air outside is. So, mm. so yes, living in a tiny house takes some adjustment, I would say. Uh, the floor definitely is cold, colder than you would expect or, or are used to if you live in a house that has a basement under it uh, and doing a two by six floor would certainly help I would say um, but also just having you know in the winter we put down mats on the floor we put down kind of temporary carpeting because it's warmer it, it adds some insulation and it, it makes it so that your feet don't have to touch the, the cool floor we have slippers that we wear in the house all the time so those are a couple things that you kind of have to do to, to adapt. It's not uncomfortable. Like you're not like sitting in the house like, oh, I wish it were warmer in here. <laughs> but, you know, the floor is cold and there's not a lot you can do about that. I gotcha. Yeah. Well, I know Scott, he also says uh, he learned how to build an earth ship, earth pounded tires and straw bale. Those are cool. And I know there's there's a lot of overlap from tiny houses to maybe slab houses to earth ships. There's a lot of structures we'll talk about and and help people understand if a tiny house may be right for them. But there's a lot of alternatives that are out there that are either centuries or as millennia, far back, millennia old. Yeah, absolutely. Just starting to be rediscovered um, separate from tiny houses. Well, let's let's get back to a couple of the questions here. I want to go back to Carrie for a moment. Uh, she also asked, this was something that I referred to right when we started talking. In what way, if any, has your life become more complicated by living in a tiny house? That's a great question. So I had never owned a home before. So I'd always been a renter. Um, so I would say that part of the answer, part of my answer is probably just normal for any homeowner and part of it is tiny house specific. And, and I would say that it does add a bit more worry and just uh, more mental overhead. And what I'm referring to in the tiny house specifically is that because the house is so small, if I were to lose heat, the house cools off very quickly and I've got plumbing, I've got appliances, particularly my hot water heater, which cannot freeze. So I would say in the winter, there's a little bit of, of mental bandwidth and overhead of needing to make sure that I have enough fuel enough propane that it's not going to run out while I'm gone. I, you know, I've got alerts set up for power outages. I, I live in an area that's pretty prone to power outages. So um, when I do get a power outage, I need to monitor it if I'm not at the house and, and make sure that it's, if it goes on for too long, I need to 
either call someone in the area to go check on the house or I need to go check on the house. Um, so those are complications in a way. Um, it all, I would say, is, is more focused around the winter. You know, when I, if I leave for a vacation or to travel in the winter, I tend to like to drain the plumbing, which isn't too hard to do, but it's, again, something to remember to do and something to add to your routine. It's not quite as easy when you're, as when you're renting an apartment and you just like shut the door and lock it and leave. And again, these might just be things that all homers, homeowners have to contend with. Um, I would say to add to the answer, um, just wanting to make sure that I stay on, you know, my neighbor's good side. Not that I've ever had any trouble with them, but because tiny houses are a legal gray area in a lot of places and my house is also, you know, I've, I've not asked permission from the town to be living in my tiny house where I'm living. You know, I, my goal is to not have anyone call the town to complain. So trying to be respectful and, and take good care of the area around the house. Let's talk about that for a moment. It seems like it's impossible to go too long talking about tiny houses with where do you actually put them? Like yeah. and I, especially in the U S I don't know about local zoning laws in Australia and New Zealand and the UK and China or other places, but um, they're not friendly. Sometimes they're explicitly set up or, or there's an institutional bias against small structures like a tiny house. So Absolutely. Janet here in the Q and a, she says, from what I've seen, other people in California who have built their own tiny houses are having a lot of trouble with zoning laws. And I know Carrie beforehand, she, like you were alluding to tiny houses, they exist sometimes in a legal gray area. Absolutely. So what, what have you done? Or when somebody asks you, Hey, Ethan, how can I limit the chance that my local zoning authority is going to come knocking on my door for a little chat because my nosy neighbor, or I had some kind of like, I kind of made them mad a little bit. And now they're essentially turning me in. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you deal with, well, let's take a step back first is, can you give us in a, in a broader sense, what are, and obviously this is very local, so it differs mm -hmm. based on the city or the municipality that you're in, but right. what are, are there certain tiers of friendliness levels when it comes to where you can park or take your tiny house? Yeah, I mean, I would say that rural is easier than urban, more because the enforcement of zoning laws in rural places tends to be more lax, and also that in a rural area, you're able to to basically hide your tiny house. Like if it's not visible from the road and it's not visible to a neighbor, then, you know, nobody knows. Um, tiny houses are, are, and tiny houses on wheels, I will say, are, are running up against the law in two ways. Um, the first way is that they potentially don't meet zoning code. So zoning is what can you do with land in X place. So like the zoning code specifies, you know, these lots can have single family houses on them between 800 and 6,000 square feet. So sometimes zoning codes will specifically say that a house can, can be, there's, that there's a minimum square footage. And a lot of times it's a lot bigger than what you'd see in a tiny house. And they also specify things like if you do have like a tra travel trailer or an RV, there are these things called setbacks. So they'll say your house has to be parked at least 12 feet from the edge of the property, at least 20 feet from any neighbor and has to be on concrete pad. So those kinds of laws can be problematic because they can just simply say, no, you can't park anything temporary in your lawn. The other side of, of the law that tiny houses are running up against is actual uh, building code. So the irony is that a tiny house on wheels, you don't have to meet code, this building code to build one because under the eyes of the law, it's just, a thing on a trailer. Mm -hmm. It's not a house. It's just a thing on a trailer. Of course, then when you want to go live in that thing, then 
the very same laws that you've skirted, you are going to bump right <laughs> back up again because it doesn't meet safety codes. And these codes are, you know, they're not, I'm not complaining about codes. They're not bad. They are there to, to guarantee our safety. You know, they are why when there's a house fire, fire people are able to come and save your life because your house has been built to a specific safety code that allows them to get in the house wearing their full gear and oxygen tanks. And, you know, I'm going off on a tangent here, but so tiny houses on wheels can be built to meet residential code, but the way that we're building them currently doesn't really meet code. And the, the biggest thing is the loft. Um, uh, a ladder accessed living space is really not, doesn't meet code for fire safety. Mm. Um, and so all of that to say, um, there are a few towns and cities who have basically declared themselves as tiny house friendly. Um, there's this place called Spur, Texas, that was the first to do it. It's like a tiny town. They're trying to attract more people. But um, most notably, Fresno, California, actually just passed um, a zoning amendment that basically allows tiny houses on wheels in, you know, in backyards. And so what's, I would say, What's not working is when people build tiny houses and then go to their local zoning office and say, hey, look, I built this, now give me permission. Like, please, right. please give me permission. That's not working as well. But what is working is people engaging with their local governments and advocating for tiny houses before they're saying, oh, I want you to make an exception for me. I'm breaking the law, but make an exception for me. Um, so in Fresno, it's really great that, that this has happened and, and people, uh, you know, various tiny house advocates are using that as a model to try to convince other towns and cities to do the same thing. Cause now you can say, look, Fresno, California, which is a city, it's a real yes. place with yeah. a lot of people. They've, they're doing this and there are actually a lot of benefits because in a lot of cities, they have reached the, the limits of, of where they can build, you know, the, the city limits have been reached and so they need more housing. And so these accessory dwelling units, um, which is what they're commonly referred to in like legal parlance right, is a great way. Accessory dwelling units? ADU, accessory dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically, if it, a lot of cities already have accessory dwelling unit laws saying, yes, you can in your backyard build a, you know, a detached, unit and now it's a matter of saying and that detached unit can be a tiny house on wheels hmm. yeah well, i gotta follow up here this is something yeah. so maggie put a question in here which mm -hmm. is related to the conversation we have about mm -hmm. legal and and how people are treating it so she says that uh, i saw something to do with recreational vehicle codes yeah. that yeah. helps to meet potential insurance requirements yeah now, i've so never thought of that before is how can I get my insurance company to insure this structure if yeah. it's not actually legally viewed as a home? Yep. So this is um, this is a big debate within the tiny house movement, uh, which is some people say we should be striving to get these things certified as RVs because that allows us to a get insurance, b park at any RV park that you know some RV parks won't allow you to park a non-certified structure. Um, and it basically, there's lots of code that's already written for RVs. The flip side of that, and the reason that I'm not a huge fan of that is because tiny houses are not RVs. You know, RVs are, are really meant for seasonal usage, recreational usage, not full-time usage. And a lot of the codes around RVs, like residential, say that, you can't live in an RV on your land, uh, like behind your house, for example. So I don't think it's necessarily prudent to get your house certified as an RV because you're basically backing yourself into a corner. You're saying, oh, look, I have this RV, but oh, whoops, I'm not allowed to live in an RV full time in most places, unless I'm in an RV park. If you want to live in an RV park, maybe it's a good way to go. But what's happening is, um, there's, and here's another creative website, tinyhouseinsurance.com, I believe. Oh. Um, 
That's a guy named Daryl Grenz. He's out in Portland, Oregon, and he's a very smart insurance person and uh, has basically, he's chipping away state by state, getting licensed to write t policies, traditional homeowners policies for tiny houses, which is wonderful. Um, because that's that's a big piece of of the puzzle that's been missing for a while. That it, it has been difficult to get insurance for your tiny house. Yeah. Well, I've got two things that tie into each other that are related to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So Green Yonder is putting something in uh, saying one of the unfortunate things about tiny house friendly places mm -hmm. is a requirement to put your tiny house on a foundation and hook it up to a sewage systems. Yep. And for you and for a lot of other folks, you do it to have a sense of freedom and liberation, yeah. especially if it's on wheels you, and yeah. you want to live more sustainably, mainly not being on city sewer system. So that kind of leads into something that uh, Tasha has here. She says, it wouldn't be a tiny house conversation without talking about toilets, toilets. I'm interested in just going with the bucket compost toilet. However, if one does not have land to compost, like for mm -hmm. example, traveling, uh, when is a compost toilet the best option? Sure. So um, there are there's a big range of composting toilets and what you know what they are, what they can do. Um, in my tiny house, I use the bucket toilet, which does need to get emptied about once per week, I would say. Um, so if you are traveling, um, you could do that, and you can. Uh, you can basically line the bucket with a trash bag and just discard the toilet contents, you know, in a dumpster. Although, again, not super environmentally friendly to do something like that. So what I would recommend for traveling is a commercial composting toilet. So instead of going with the bucket, going with, um, there's a company called Nature's Head that makes a great composting toilet. And what, what those will do is they actually separate the urine from the solid waste. So you have to sit down, guys, to use them. Um, but what that allows, so and then what happens inside of this unit is the solid waste goes into one place and there's a an exhaust fan that basically vents to the outside and dries out the waste. And um, not to get too graphic, but but human waste is like mostly water. So once it gets dried out, it actually doesn't, really smell all that bad and it, it shrinks in size quite a bit. And then the urine goes into a separate tank which you can empty into a toilet or empty urine can be used to, to feed plants just directly on the soil, feed a tree. Um, so the commercial composting toilets, because they separate urine and, and solid waste, they don't need to be emptied nearly as much. We're talking the weeks or even months depending on, on use. So for traveling, a commercial composting toilet might be a better option than, than the human or bucket toilet. Can we see a picture? Can you get, show us a picture of the toilet that you're using sure. in your tiny house? Let's see if I've got one here. I'm sure I've got one. Just I'm scrolling through my, my long photo. I, you know, I, there you go. There's something I need to add to my presentation. I don't think I have a picture of the toilet. Huh. I feel like I've seen it either in your tiny house decisions guide or somewhere else. Yeah, like, it's definitely there. Um, okay. And I, I actually, I have a, I think I have a blog post on my website about the composting toilet. So I can, uh, I can post that up in the comments or I can share the link. Okay. And you're at the tiny house.net for at folks who aren't already familiar with you. Yeah. I'm going to, there you go. Huh. There's a, there's a couple of pretty cool green yonder saying that uh, somebody keeps her worms in mm -hmm. her composted stuff, vermiculturing her poop. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Why not? It's just a part of the natural life cycle of things yep. coming in and going out of the earth and the world. Absolutely. And that's, that's another method of composting is the vermiculture. Let's take, um, a broader view here. Sure. I know we've kind of been expanding and contracting with tactical and strategic stuff. And for some of the people who are in, more interested in the why to than the how to, mm -hmm. this is a comment that we got earlier regarding intentional living. Yep. And I feel like part of this we address actually the last conversation, Simple Rev conversation with Anthony Ongaro, mm -hmm. which is at simplerev.com slash AO webinar. 
Um, we'll probably address this pretty well, Ethan, but you've got a different perspective and uh, a different feel for it. And when it comes to technology, of which you are no stranger to, you are incredibly technology savvy in a lot of ways. Uh, Carrie said that the, the tiny house, she sees that as a way to cut the cord or at least put the brakes on a lot of the technology use that she doesn't exactly want to have in her life, but she feels compelled to um, and gets stressed out about. Do you have any tips to either transition into a tiny house and cut the cord from some technology use that people are using or be mindful of your technology use while you're in a tiny house? Well, I think it's it's an interesting question. I think that your tiny house can be whatever you want it to be for your lifestyle. I actually gave a presentation at the tiny house conference all about tiny house lifestyle design and talking about what is your why? Like, why are you building the tiny house? What is it that you want your life to be like in it? You can design for that. You can make the tiny house do that for you. And so if, if it's a matter of of cutting the cord, you know, don't wire the house, don't have internet in the house, don't put a screen on the wall, don't, you know, don't hang a TV on the wall. Uh, because if you do put it there, you're going to be in constant contact with it because the house is tiny. So everything you have in it is in your environment 24 7. Mm -hmm. There's not really many, you know, it's not like you can have a TV room where you, can close the door. That's the and purpose of the TV. room is right. we watch TV in here. Exactly. Yes, you'll do that in about 12 other things if you have a tiny house. Right. So um, I would say that don't put, you know, if, if you don't, if you want to cut the cord and be, be away from technology, then don't incorporate it in your tiny house. And um, just a general lifestyle thing, what, what, what we've found in our tiny house is that it motivates us to go outside way more because you just you see the outside way more because it's so small you're always in view of a window you're always seeing what the outside environment is doing so when i'm at the tiny house i find that even though you know i didn't choose to cut the cord i have internet because i you know i work online i need the internet and you know we have a, a screen mounted on the wall where we can watch netflix or amazon or whatever but I find that I don't sit in front of my computer as much there because I just am reminded more frequently that there is this kind of outside world to go and experience and there's no shortage of things to do to the land around the house, you know, raking, cleaning, all this kind of stuff. So in a way, your tiny house will force you to cut the cord because it's a more direct way of, of living on the earth but it also, you have to, to intentionally choose to not include the things that you don't want. Does that make sense? Is that a good answer? Well, I'm the only one who can All right. verbally engage you right now, and it made plenty of sense to me. <laughs> okay, good. Knowing that you're an eloquent guy in general, I have a feeling that that's resonating with everybody okay. else who's watching, okay. too. Well, uh, we're, we might bounce around a little bit here, but there's a couple of things that are uh, that are relevant, and... Green Yonder, you're awesome mm -hmm. just at answering people's comments and questions just in the comments. But this, this one comes from Wendy who has a third of an acre mm -hmm. and she's thinking about putting up to four tiny houses on a third of an acre. Mm -hmm. Do you have any general advice in terms of per square foot of yard or per eighth of an acre, how many tiny houses could, should, would optimally fit or yeah, well, you have thoughts? I mean, I I don't have a an answer to that question, and I don't think there's necessarily a right answer. What I would say is that if you own this land, that I and, and if I owned the land and I was in a situation that you were in, I would probably seek to work with my town and my zoning up front before starting, and of course risk getting told no. But I think if you're going to invest in three to four tiny houses, and especially if they're going to be ground bound and not on wheels, it would be much more in your interest to get permission or to, to figure out what would be permissible and work within those confines versus 
you know, investing, say you build three tiny houses, you could invest, you know, you could invest a hundred thousand dollars and then get told that they're illegal and you need to remove them. And that would not be fun. No. Hmm. It's, it seems like every single question that I have that other people are asking, there's so much nuance to it. And there's so much context that I feel like you need in order to answer it fully and really well. Yep. There's a lot of yep. backstory and what are the, are there easy questions? Like do people ever come up and ask you and say, what should I do here? And just like, oh, of course do this. hundred percent of people agree mm -hmm. that you should totally do this when it comes to it. Where's, where's the low hanging fruit? Is there any? Well, you know, there's, there is low hanging fruit in terms of your, your systems decisions, you know, deciding how you're going to heat it, how you're going to plumb it, all those kinds of nitty gritty things. Although even within those, everything is a trade off in a tiny house. You know, if you, if you go with uh, wood heat that doesn't require electricity or propane, then you're kind of a slave to the stove and to chopping wood. Um, so there's, there's trade offs in every decision. And unfortunately, well, maybe no, maybe, maybe everything has nuance because it is a small space. I was introduced to the concept of, of Wabi Sabi, which is a Japanese, uh, I think, I guess you could call it a design theory. Um, and it's really about imperfection and, and transience and, and like incompleteness as, as being beautiful and as being a design aesthetic. And, a tiny house is is an exercise in wabi sabi because for every decision you make, there's this equal and opposite reaction that pushes you in the other direction. You know, you if you want the tiny house to be really well insulated, then you're eating into your living space. If you want the tiny house to be wider, then you limit your ability to tow it. You know, there's there's kind of a trade off in almost every aspect of it, where in a normal house where you can just make the house bigger to add whatever feature you want and you don't, there's no trade off. You can just do it if you have yeah. the money. Yeah. Well, it's not just choices and decisions. There's things that are just fundamentally different yeah. that I wouldn't even consider before. So I've got one more for you, Ethan. Sure. You can, uh, ask a question about your thoughts on GPS tracking systems. Apparently there's a story about some guy in Texas who built a tiny house who had it stolen. Yeah. Um, and maybe other people have, whether it's on wheels or not, it's small enough where people could literally yeah. take your house and move it somewhere. Yep. Do you think GPS tracking is important when it comes to having a tiny house? You know, I think that if you live in an area where your tiny house is going to get a lot of exposure and you're not going to be there a lot, then it might not be a terrible idea. Um, I actually have a whole blog post on the tinyhouse.net about different tiny house security options. Oh. Um, and so those include wheel locks. A hitch lock is great, which basically prevents someone from hitching the, the house to their truck without breaking this lock off. Um, taking the wheels off is also a great thing because, you know, putting wheels on, you know, it, it takes some time. It really depends how often you're going to be there. Okay. An answer with nuance yeah. and a lot of context that will be different for each person. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's, that's hey. how it goes in tiny houses. It's different <laughs> for each person. Well, the themes are consistent here and uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll be able to get, we've got a couple of other folks who have some pretty nifty stuff, but yeah. Ethan, I mean, you've been so gracious with your time and your resources and your wisdom and your experiences and some of the gotchas here. I know there's more, I've already made reference to it. You know, I've, I've gone through your guide, your tiny house mm -hmm. decisions guide. And I just wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity briefly to mention out of all the things that you're telling us about, a lot of it is because so you know a lot of best practices and you have a lot of wisdom, but you've aggregated through interviews and other conversations. Just can you tell us a little bit about this tiny house decisions dealio? Sure. Yeah. Um, so tiny house decisions is kind of my, my magnum opus, I would say it's um, about 200 pages of all these decisions that we've been talking about and many more presented in their full nuance with all the pros and cons for each one. So I've actually pulled up the actual book here 
And, you know, I start with the big decisions, you know, is a tiny house right for you? Should you build it with help or do it yourself? Um, what should the overall size be? And then I get into all these systems. So heat, water, winter, hot water, toilets, electric, everything. And then we talk about construction decisions, you know, different building techniques and how it affects the weight and the, the overall construction of the house. And I even get a little bit into after building. So infrastructure, moving in, and I present some resources. So it's really my, my complete guide. It's, you know, it's pretty nice. It's got lots of good color pictures in it. And this is kind of my main vehicle for, for helping people with their tiny houses. Um, because I don't build tiny houses for people. Um, I, this is my, you know, this is the way I do it. So it's, it's at my website, thetinyhouse.net. Um, there's a link right at the top to tiny house decisions. Neat. So I would imagine it's best for people who are in a certain phase and this, I'm, I'm still looking at the questions here and Tina's got another one, which green yonder has addressed mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tina asks, what are the phases of tiny house living? And green yonder saying that there's the research slash dreaming phase mm -hmm. where it's just someday, like wouldn't it be glorious if someday this could happen? There's design, which we could talk all about plans uh -huh. and other things, uh, getting a trailer, like making the commitment and then building it and finding a place to put it. What do you see as the major phases from someday I would love to have a tiny home to, holy crap, I'm living in a tiny home. Well, I think, I think Green Yonder did a great job of, of nailing it there. You've got your, your dreaming and design phase you've got your real like design, like I'm going to draw floor plans and, and look at, you know, what this thing is really going to look like. And then you've got your building phase and then you've got your moving in phase and then you've got your rest of your life phase. Um, so, so the book really starts at the start with helping you answer some of the questions in that early dreaming phase of like, is tiny house living really even for me? Should it be mobile? Should it be ground bound? How does that affect what I can build? And it goes all the way through, you know, all those phases. All right. Yeah. Man, I feel like I've taken a survey course in tiny houses. For as much as I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you and everybody else, and as much as I love talking about tiny houses, I, it's just been revealed to me how little I still know and how much more I want to know, despite the fact that I don't think I will ever live in a tiny house, but I would never say never. Uh, never say never. Yeah. With two young children, like I have a five and a half year old and a two and a half year old, although maybe I could, doesn't really sound like my idea of a good time at this point, Yeah. but it's awesome. It just as part of the broader simple living movement to yep. see millions, probably tens of millions of people all around the world. Yep. I, I'm, anytime I want to test somebody and see how interested they are in slow living, being intentional, uh, how much gratitude and how generous they are, I can just like m one of my best, hey, let's feel mm -hmm. them out is just say tiny houses, go. And for the people who are just excited, which are a lot of people, their eyes, they just get really big. They're like, whoa, yeah. wait, you want to talk tiny houses with me? Yes. Let's nerd out about it. Well, Joel, I would recommend a book for you and for anyone else who, you know, is trying to figure out what tiny house living could mean for them. It's a book called Little House on a Small Planet, and it is by Shay Solomon, hmm. the author. And it's a wonderful look at different families, people all around the world who are living in smaller houses. And there are some wonderful examples of families um, and seeing how families adapt to small house living and urban, rural, you name it. So it's a great, it's a great book. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Well, I want to, we we planned for an hour. We're at an hour. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I'm sure there's some other folks, depending on what time zone they're in. It seems like we have mostly North Americans here, at least at the start they indicated, but I'm sure we have folks from all around the world who are watching us, who either they need to get to sleep, need to get to lunch. But before we, we do, and maybe we can even have a bonus question at the end, because there's a couple of really good ones here. 
I just want to point out too, as far as simple rev goes and, and we're Ethan, we're super grateful that you've let me let us host this conversation with you. We've got some tiny house enthusiasts. Huh? Look at that. It's the first Wednesday of the, Oh, can anyone else hear the sirens going off the tornado no, sirens? Not me. Okay, good. I guess that's why I got this microphone. So it wouldn't pick up the ambient noise. I got distracted for a moment, but really when it comes to tiny houses, like here in the Twin Cities, Troy Kobsky, who has participated going back to our Simple Rev 2014 events. He's even doing some tiny house workshops. There's a lot of really cool people doing things at the local level, which is what we love helping people out with. So if anyone's interested in connecting with tiny housers and minimalists and permaculturalists and homesteaders, mindfulness pros, zero waste folks, we have uh, Simple Rev Local these free intimate and reoccurring community groups that are helping everybody, regardless of what step you are on the simple living journey. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to mention if folks want to hear a little bit more about that, just like they're going to explore a lot more about you, they can go to simplerev.com slash local. Maybe there's an active simple rev local community in their area. Uh, we've got them in Minneapolis and Sydney and Wellington and Portland and even Sandwich, Illinois. Uh, if there's nothing going on and you want to be a catalyst for tiny houses through Simple Rev or just have a bunch of folks who don't think that you're a freak show for wanting to talk about tiny houses and who will love it just as much as you do, it can be a pretty neat resource as well. Well, Ethan, is there okay. anything that we didn't chat about that you want folks to know? I mean, there's always more to chat about when it comes to tiny houses, but... Um... I'd like to thank you for hosting and um, thank all those awesome people who were on the call asking and answering questions. It was really fun to, to connect. Yeah. And Todd, I know you've got some things like what percentage of tiny house on wheels actually travel and move them around. We're not going to be able to get to things like that today. Obviously, Ethan's, Ethan's not going away. He's a fixture in the tiny house community and it's awesome to have him here. So you can catch him on the tinyhouse.net. Um, if you want, maybe Todd, you're coming in late or other folks are coming in late and you want to see if we covered something. We'll email folks who signed up uh, to this conversation in the next 24 hours to give you a link to the replay, which will also be up on the Simple Rev YouTube channel. And if you want to see if you're antsy and you want to see if it's available, but you haven't got a notification from YouTube yet or you don't use it, you can go to simplerev.com slash EW chat. Well, I guess, I guess it's the end of this verbal conversation at least, but I really, I again, so. everyone who joined us live and if you're watching on the replay, thank you so much. We really hope that you'll keep the chatter going with your fellow participants, tiny house enthusiasts, whether it's on our Google event page, through Simple Rev, with Ethan, wherever you want. It's just wonderful to see so many people who are so eager to get more intentional and to, uh, to downsize their lives, to right size in some really cool ways. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. We appreciate it.